It's very important that we begin to learn how to create wealth. I'm not talking about loving money. See, I believe the lack of money is the root of all evil. People are steal for money. People are killed for money. People go to jail for money. Every time the unemployment goes up, in those areas where the unemployment is high, that's where you have the highest incidence of crime and violence. Whenever the unemployment goes up 1% in our community, 10,000 children and women are battered. One money makes a difference in your life. I never wanted to be rich. All I've ever wanted to do was to be comfortable. How many have ever wanted to be comfortable? Raise your hands. Then I realized in order to be comfortable, you got to be rich. An old friend of mine, Zig Ziglar, said, people say money won't make you happy, but everybody want to find out for themselves. <laughs> Rita Davenport said, money ain't important, but it's right up there with oxygen. And let me tell you something, fellas, even if you're as homeless as I am, if you got some money, women will find something cute on you. <laughs> He got earlobed like Denzel, honey. <laughs> money makes a difference. I used to be so broke when creditors would call the house, my children would answer the phone and say, my daddy say he ain't whole. <laughs> I was so broke at one time in my life, I walked by a bank and tripped the alarm. <laughs> I tell you, poverty sucks. You hear me? <laughs> Repeat after me, please. I'll never be broke again. Yes, write that down. I affirm that I'll never be broke again. Never. Never will I ever be broke again. Let me tell you what money does. Number one, it gives you control over your life. Write that down. Number two, it gives you options. Three, it allows you to live a life of contribution, to contribute to things that you feel strongly about. Like this ministry and the work of Project 2000 will be doing to change the lives of young people. Bishop Jake's vision is if we can have Little League football teams and baseball teams and basketball teams, then we can have Little League dermatologists and cardiologists and endocrinologists. So he's now establishing an institution, Project 2000, to give our young people the methods and the techniques to reinvent themselves as we go into the next millennium. And this era that Peter Drucker calls the era of the three C's, accelerated change, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. So here's the first step to accumulating wealth. If you expect to do it, write this down. You must be willing to do the things today others won't do. In order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. That's why the Book of Life said the road to life is straight and narrow and few there be that find it because few there be that are willing to do the things today others won't do. In order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. What are the things that others won't do? Number one, make discipline a major force in your life. How many of you know if you'd have been more disciplined, you'd be further along to reach your goals right now? Socrates said the undisciplined life is an insane life. The road to life is straight and narrow because few there be that are willing to discipline themselves. Here's something else that most people won't do. Make it okay to fail. A lot of people, 85% of people, allow their fear of failure to outweigh their desire to succeed. Repeat after me, please. Anything that's worth doing is worth doing badly. Yeah, see, anything is worth doing is worth doing right, as we have been taught, if you know how to do it. But if you don't know how to do it, is worth doing badly until you get it right. I bet you, and I wasn't there, I bet you that when Bishop T.D. Jakes first stood up to preach, when he gave his trial sermon, he did not have the command, he did not have the mastery, he did not have the confidence, he did not have the depth, 
He did not have the capacity to translate and milk scripture like he did last night when he first started out. Now write this down. You don't have to be great to get started, but you have to get started to be great. The first time I stood up to speak, I stood up and my mind sat down. I looked at the audience and I panicked. I had to introduce a play at school. Uh, we're about, we're about to start a, uh, 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 Ran off, Mr. Washington. Mr. Brown, where are you going? Uh, Mr. Washington, I, I can't think, sir. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. Did you rehearse? Yes, sir, I did. Well, what's wrong? Why did you say your lines? I, 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 don't, I don't know, sir. I, I just I got up and I looked at him and everything left me. Let me do it another day, please, sir. No, go back out there, Mr. Brown. Mr. Washington, I'll mess up, please, sir. Don't, 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 don't send me out there now. I'll mess up. Mr. Brown, if you run now, you will always be running. Anything that's worth doing is worth doing badly until you get it right. Why are you moving like that? I got to go to the bathroom, sir. Mr. Brown. Go back out there. Yes, sir. We have uh, a start a plea called 12 Angry Men, directed by Mr. Leroy Washington. And I ran off. The next day, hey, Alfalfa! Hey, Les Brown, how are you? They dogged me out. They talked about me so bad. The next time another event came up, Mr. Washington, Mr. Brown, you're up. I said, no, Mr. Washington. Everybody says, no, not him. I said, they're right, Mr. Washington, not me. He said, Mr. Brown, you're up. Yes, sir. And I went out and pretty soon when people laughed at me, it didn't bother me. They would throw paper and I could catch it without losing my concentration. And then one day, I came out and a hush went across the audience because it must have been something about me that indicated that I had come to myself. And Mr. Washington had been practicing with me to give a presentation. And I looked at the audience and I said, I choose not to be a common man. It's my right to be uncommon if I can. I seek opportunity, not security. I do not wish to be a kept citizen, humbled and dull by having the state look after me. I want to take the calculated risk to dream and to build, to fail and to succeed. I refuse to live from hand to mouth. I prefer the challenges of life to the guaranteed existence, the thrill of fulfillment to the stale calm of utopia. I will never cower before any master, nor bend to any threat. It's my heritage to stand erect, proud and unafraid, to face the world boldly and say, this I have done. Girl stood up say, that's my boyfriend, honey. I like me some less proud, baby. <laughs> but I didn't start off like that. You have something special. You have talents and abilities in you that you don't even know. So how do we begin to create wealth? Let me give you some, some ideas. Number one, write this down, knowledge. What knowledge that you have in this economy, part of what we need, that people are willing to pay you for that. Next is talent. What talent? Dion's talent is playing football. I didn't have that as a talent. My talent is talking. To me, my definition of success is doing what you love to do and find somebody to pay you to do it. <laughs> so I find people to pay me to talk. I talk. I brought a game to this, to this country called Beard Whist that I invented. And that's how I talk. I shoot pool. I signify. I make you tear up your cards, break your pew stick, because I talk a lot of trash. I throw you off. You've never been to Boston. I'll take you there. So I learned how to signify and talk trash, all right? So I make a living talking trash to AT&T. I make more in one hour than 90% of the American public earn working for a whole year doing what I love to do. That I've developed my talent. You want to master your talent. Find out what it is that you love to do. I love to talk. Scripture is another key that says to us of what we need to do to begin to develop ourselves. Luke 12, 34, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So what do you love to do? 
and then explore ways in which you can earn a living doing that. Cooking, writing, painting, working with numbers, working with people. The other thing is not only must you have knowledge, talent, some skill, but the other thing that's important, faith to act on whatever your dream is. See, if you don't believe in yourself, how many people you know that have a lot of talent, a lot of abilities, but they don't believe in themselves? Raise your hands. See, that faith is very important. So the faith to act on those dreams, those desires. Here's scripture that I, that I like very much. Proverbs 16, 16 chapter, third verse. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Commit means to carry into action deliberately. Commit means to make it happen no matter what. Commitment, the difference between next time you have bacon and eggs, the chicken was involved, the pig was committed. He had to give it all up. That's going to take a minute to sink in tonight, all right? See, when you make the commitment, I'm going to become wealthy, when you make it important, when you decide I'm going to do it no matter what, Life changes for you. See, most people don't keep their commitments to their commitments. That's why they lead lives of poverty, lives of misery, lives of unhappiness. Socrates said the uncommitted life isn't worth living. So part of what you must do, whatever commitment, whatever covenant you make with God while you're here, to go back to be a better father, to go back to make a difference in the community, to go back to change your life, to decide not to ever to use drugs or alcohol again to decide to bet that you're going to begin to recreate yourself, that you're going to be reborn to a new state of consciousness. Whatever commitment that you make, keep your commitment to your commitment. No matter what, if it's hard, then do it hard. But keep your commitment to your commitment. And then it says, thy works. See, now most people look at that, commit thy works. Most people look at activity that one engages in to achieve a predetermined objective. But works, commit thy works, it pluralizes, there's an S there. Learn this from Bishop. You gotta watch these things in scripture. Just can't go on the surface. There's an S, then say commit thy work, whatever task, whatever talent, whatever skill, whatever knowledge you have, and begin to make money doing that, making a difference, impacting people's lives. But commit thy work, so there's two kinds of work. There's external work, activity that you're engaged in, and there is internal work. Now, why is that important? The Pharisees said to Jesus, when shall the kingdom of God come? The kingdom of God coming not by observation. They shall say, it's neither lo there, lo here, behold, the kingdom of God within you. It's within you. Seek ye first the kingdom, and all these things will be added unto you. Wealth, good relationship, peace of mind, good health, better community, whatever you want to desire a more powerful ministry. So the work is internal as well as external. So therefore, number one is, first step is you got to live your calling. You got to decide what is it you love. Second thing is, you got to work on yourself. Write this down under work on yourself. You don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. You have a ministry and you have 300 people, that's a reflection of you. You have 2,000, that's a reflection of you. You have a job, you're generating $1,200 a year, or $2,000, or $500,000, whatever you earn, whatever you're producing in your life is a reflection of you. That's why it says, judge a tree by the fruit it bears. I can look at what you're producing and I can tell you a lot about who you are. And if you look at people who are living below their potential and sinning, and sin in the Aramaic language means falling short of the mark. I asked the question earlier, how many of you have goals? Do you raise your hands? How many of you know if you had your life to live over again, you can do more than what you've done? The majority of us raise our hands. Then that was an indication, that was testimony to reflect the fact that you operate operating below your potential. That's a sin. Hearing my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. Didn't just say fruit, much fruit. See, when you leave here, you've got to make a commitment to be more fruitful, to be more productive, to make greater impact. So what will allow you to do that? You've got to spend time working on yourself. 
In order to do, write this down, in order to do something you've never done, you've got to be someone you've never been. In order to do something you've never done, you've got to be someone you've never been. That's why Scripture says you must be born again. You've got to die as you are now. You've got to be willing to give up who you are now for what you can become. Certain things will no longer fit into your life. There's no place for it. In order to do something you've never done, you've got to be someone you've never been. So you've got to spend serious time reading, writing your goals down, reading scripture, anchoring yourself spiritually to handle the storms of life because they're going to come. You've got to read things that will help to develop your mind, your consciousness. Your attitude, this man changed my life, Mr. Leroy Washington. I was in his class one day, and I was waiting on another student. He came in, and he said, young man, go to the board and work this problem out for me. I said, um, I, I can't do that, sir. And he said, why not? I'm not one of these students, sir. He said, it doesn't matter. Go to the board and work the problem out anyhow. Uh, I, I, I can't do what you're asking me to do, sir. Why not? because I'm, I'm educable, mentally retarded, sir. And all the kids laughed because they knew I was in special education. And then he came from behind his desk and he looked at me. He said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. <laughs> Most of us live within the context of somebody else's opinion of us. I saw a movie a few weeks ago called The Truman Show with Jim Carrey. Not a very popular movie. But there was one line in there that made it worth the movie for me. This young man was born under the camera. That somebody set up a, a gigantic studio and created the life of a real person to act out in the context of a soap opera. Everybody knew but him. All of it was created, was fabricated. And then when he discovered it, he was trying to escape. And, and the guy said, he won't get out. And the guy said, why? He said, he won't leave. The guy said, why would you say that? He said, because most people accept the reality that they have been given. Do you hear that? See, most people are not creating wealth. Why? Because they were born in poverty. And they go through life unconscious. They don't know that they can have more. They don't know that they can be more. They say the words, I can do all things with Christ who strengthens me. We're more than conquerors, but subconsciously. And that's how you judge if a person really knows. See, if you know it, you're doing it. If you know it, you're living it. If you know it, you're manifesting it. You're producing it. And so therefore, as you look at yourself, you've got to have this vision of yourself beyond your circumstances. You've got to see yourself every day. I can do this. I can make this happen. I'm blessed and highly favored. Good things are supposed to happen to me. You've got to see yourself every day working on your goals. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a three by five card, and here's a scripture I want you to put on the back of that card. Matthew seventh chapter and the seventh verse. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now put that on one side of the card, and on the flip side write your goal down. And read that three times a day, whatever that goal is. My goal was to buy my mother home. I read that three times a day, ask and it shall be given, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened. Every day, I have a goal right now. My goal's on this card. I read it three times a day, sometimes more. I read that scripture, then I read my goal. To put that in my subconscious mind, why? Our thoughts have magnetic power. Demonstration. How many have ever thought about somebody and they call you out of the blue? Raise your hands, please. You say, I was just thinking about you. You were on my mind. See, thoughts have power. We think, according to psychologists, 40 to 50,000 thoughts a day. So well, now you want to begin to horn in on your thoughts. Keep an eye single. You want to focus. You want to begin to discipline yourself. 
to control your thinking. Most people never achieve their goals because they allow themselves to be sidetracked by secondary activities, the distractions of life. Peter would still be walking on the water had he not allowed himself to be distracted. People are all concerned about the scandal that's going on in the White House, obsessed with it, going out, buying newspapers and books to read about it. They should be obsessed by their own lives. What's it to be? You should be so focused, so busy on your own life, keeping the main thing, the main thing, until you're oblivious as to what's going on around you. You don't have time. People ask me, do you think he did it? I don't know and I don't care. It's not putting any money in my pocket. And if I was advising him when I went into that grand jury, all I would have done is just started speaking in tongues. That would have fixed him. Chevrolet Honda Honda Toyota Toyota. Yeah, you have the Honda 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 what would Kim Starr say then? Cross-examine that. They wouldn't have been able to get him on perjury. Headlines were read the next day, the president spoke in tongues, my lord. I got to pray for y'all. Y'all something else, I mean. <laughs> well, uh, the event in Finland will be, we will discuss a lot, of, all, a lot also about responsible business and yes. good business ethics. What is responsibility all about in your eyes? Re responsibility to me is, it's about understanding and knowing that you have the power to control your destiny, that it's about living your life from a place of creation, that most people go through life doing what I call living their lives as volunteer victims. When you take responsibility for your life, it's about knowing that you have to develop yourself, that you don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. You have to develop your mind, you have to develop your skills, you have to have a talent, ability, that, that you are cultivating so that you can create value for the world with what it is you have with your gift. There are three primary reasons that most people don't, in my estimation, achieve their greatness. And one is that most people don't know what they have going for them. For years, I did not do what I'm doing now because I didn't believe in myself. The second reason is most people don't know how to earn money using their talents, their abilities, their skills, and their gifts. And the third reason is that most people don't know how to gain access to the people that will pay them for what they know. So as entrepreneurs, one, we have to believe in ourselves, and that's an ongoing process, engaging in things that, that will help us to believe in ourselves because we, we are cultivated in a world where we're told more about our limitations rather than our potential. And so faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing, and so we have to constantly go to seminars, go to workshops, listen to audio programs, and, and read books that will help to expand our vision of ourselves of what's possible for us. And, and the other thing is that's very important is working to expand your skill set, to develop your skills, to take your skills to the next level. And the other thing that's important is, is having relationships with people that you can learn from, that you can grow from, people that will challenge you and that will cause you to raise the bar on yourself and hold you accountable to a higher standard. Who have been the best speakers, coaches, mentors you know for, for yourself? When, when I think in terms of, of mentors, I think in terms of uh, Mr. Leroy Washington, who was a high school teacher of mine, who told me, Mr. Brown, develop your mind and develop your communication skills, because once you open your mouth, you tell the world who you are. Uh, I, I admired his communication skills. He's a speech and drama instructor when I was in high school. The other was Dr. Anthony Sweeting, um, that he and I now work together. We were raised together and, as kids, and, and he's a great orator. and has such raw talent, ability, and power. I, I admire him. And Mike Williams, who's been a, a strategist and, and has taught me the value of having content as well as the skill to deliver a message that will empower people. Those have been the, the greatest mentors for me in terms of my style and what I deliver and the experience that I create when I'm speaking to an audience. 
how would you respond when someone's back is up against the wall they're facing failure failure time and time again let me just share a little quick story years ago i worked with tony robbins in 1999 i was working with tony robbins i thought model one of the best it was either you stephen covey or it was tony robbins and at the time mike i had a little connection into tony robbins so i went with tony robbins yes and i got so pumped after a year of working there i gave over 240 presentations what a great training opportunity as i traveled the country and just was able to present so many times and finally he said on stage talking about living your dreams he said when would now be a good time he told the 5000 people audience and i remember i nudged my wife and i said that's my that's my calling man I, I i'm making an excuse for myself it's time for me to go live my dream anyway long story short i left the tony robbins organization i called my parents i said mom dad can we and the kids stay at your home for just a couple months as i do my first seminar our other home, our home was actually rented out at the time because we were traveling so much, so I couldn't go there. And mom and dad said, absolutely. Well, those two months turned into five years in the basement of their house. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh. And in my darkest moment, I took, my wife says, you should go get a job. I said, but my, I hear Les Brown in me, right? My calling is to do this. There's got to be a way. I can't just give up on the... 10 yard line or whatever and she said well what are you gonna do and i said honey i'm gonna go write a book and she said you're gonna do what you're gonna do you have you even read a book anyway i said i'm gonna go write a book and we had a car repossessed so we ended up with one card and i decided i can't write where the kids are so i drove down to the grocery store parking lot and i started to type and two months later if you think you can was pub was written and i'm telling you it was published about three months later and from then my world in 2005 turned overnight that book became an international bestseller back in 2005 and we just came out with the with the 15th version it's coming out next week and so it's it's just unbelievable as i have always told audiences believe in yourself Believe in your dreams, figure out the right strategy, but never, never give up. I don't know, how, how do you counsel people to respond to those kinds of challenges without giving up? Well, first of all, we always have a choice. There's something in us, TJ, as you know, that's greater than anything that we face, even though we have no evidence to point to, to prove it. Like, as I'm speaking to you now, I had to prepare myself mentally because I'm in pain as I speak to you. The cancer has eaten 40% of my T1 vertebrae and metastasized to the T2 to T3 and to the C7. Uh, and I, I just spoke to an audience this morning and I said, a doctor looked at me and, and, and he said three words that no one ever wants to hear. He, he said, you have cancer. And the audience got quiet and I said, sir, can you give me a second opinion? He said, yes. And you're ugly too. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I said, no, you didn't. I said, I got issues. I got issues. <laughs> here's, here's the thing. Life is a fight for territory. And once you stop fighting for what you are, what you don't want will automatically take over. So I could have said, and I, even now I can say, this pain is just too great. But my affirmation to myself, whenever I'm going through a tough time, and I'm a 27 year cancer conqueror, no matter how bad it is or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. And I think that people who make it through the storms of life, and we're always gonna have storms. Forrest Gump said life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. My book of life says that they could not strange that you are faced the fiery furnaces of this world. You will, not you might, you will have tribulations. It's called life. And so what's key is to visualize and see yourself on the other side and, and hold that vision. He said, I'll give you all your eyes can see. Hold that vision and say to yourself, 
wow, that came out great. I made it through. I learned some things. Every day for 27 years, I've been saying, I thank God I'm cancer free. And people say, wait a minute, you've been saying that for 27 years. I mean, obviously it's not gonna happen. I said, no, that's not true. Number one, I'm still here. Augmentino say, persist until you succeed. Well, just think, 27 years, look, when will a baby walk? It will walk when it walks. When will it talk? It will talk when it talks, and some talk sooner than others. And so many times we give up out of frustration and lack of patience. And to me, the people that make it through have a series of, of, of perseverance, persistence, and patience. And they show up with that every day until they get the desired results that they want. I know, there's not, I don't believe, I know that I'm going to be free of cancer, that this is not a, unto death. There's something that I have to align myself with because cancer cells have gone crazy. And so as I'm working on myself and working on the goals and dreams and other areas of my, my life that I have not resolved yet, that I'm just persistent and I'll keep coming back again and again and again. And as I told my children, even a broke clock is right twice a day. <laughs> A <laughs> brother's going to break through. That is, that is so awesome. Despite your the cancer challenge, if you call it a challenge or not, um, you're it's still out because you get to know things about yourself that you don't know. Yeah, right. That it introduces you to a part of yourself that you're not familiar with. That it helps you to begin to prioritize things and determine what's important, what's not important. The things that I would get angry about that I just let pass. For instance, I was coming down the sidewalk yesterday when I arrived here in New Jersey, in Philadelphia, and a guy had his luggage on the sidewalk and he saw me coming. All he had to do was just pull his luggage back so that I can come by. He refused to move it. He's standing there with his wife. And so, which meant that I had to move my luggage and carry it into the streets and then get back on the sidewalk. And so he said, good, I'm glad you did that. And I said, thank you. And I got into the, the car that was waiting for me. And I said to my friend, I said, you know what? <laughs> there was a time that I'd have whooped his ass. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wanted to look at him at one time. I said, you about to make me lose my mind. Up in here, up in here. I took my stuff on the sidewalk, and that wasn't enough. You wanted to taunt me. You wanted to tease me. You, you want to act like you punk me out. And I said, but at 74, no, because every emotion, I mean, I laugh a lot. Why? One minute of laughter boosts your immune system for over 24 hours. Think about that. One minute of laughter boosts your immune system for over 24 hours. So people who are watching us now, after we get through, they will get sick for 20 years. Now, <laughs> one minute of laughter of, of anger weakens your immune system for four to five hours. Yeah. So I deliberately don't get angry. I choose not. Anger is a wind that blows out the lamp of the mind. I study psychoneuroimmunology. I know that the, the thoughts that we have, they create gene expressions. I know it creates a certain type of chemistry in our body that's toxic. And so I can't afford, as, as, as a cancer conqueror, to get angry. I choose not to go there. And, and we always have a choice. And I believe that uh, the type of program that you have, it gives people the mental and emotional and, and, and psychological and spiritual muscle to have a clarity of mind to stand back and say, you know what, I'm not gonna go there. I, I, I'm not gonna let this get to me. I'm better than this and rise above it and move on with their lives. Wow, that's powerful. Thank you for sharing all that. I, uh, You said, you, you put a little nugget in there I like, which I wanna draw attention to which you just said some people give up on their goals because they lack patience. And that made me think of the law of the harvest, which has three laws, right? You reap what you sow. Yes. Increased returns, you get more than you sow, right? right. And then the third thing is delayed gratifications. And so sometimes we give up on our goals 
uh, because we haven't given time for those seeds to to nourish and bear fruit, right? We give up a little bit too early. And I, anyway, any thoughts on that? Yes. Well, there are some things that you're pursuing. I, I see that that we grow from people and from projects. I'll be a better person at the end of this program because of our communication. We grow mm-hmm. from people and projects. And so when we have projects, they challenge us. Why? Because we always, if we want to grow into a serious, choose projects that's beyond our comfort zone. Because in order to do something you've never done, you've got to become someone you've never been. That's good. And so there are experiences that you're going to have in the process. Some things will happen to you and some things will happen for you. And so I believe that those things that happen for us that sometimes we're aware of, but most of the time we're not. That's what psychologists call your scotomas, your blind spots. Right. That a, a, a lady, she's an intuitive and she, she wrote me a note when she found out that I was a 27 year cancer conqueror. And she says, this is not unto death to you. She said, search your heart and find out what's there because, and she was one of the people that gave me a book years ago that I read called, Who's the Matter With Me? Mm-hmm. And what I realized, TJ, and this is the first time I ever talked about this publicly, that uh, somewhere in me that I had not consciously recognized that I had anger at my birth mother mm-hmm. and father. How could you bring someone in this world who didn't choose to be here and walk away. And even though we are told, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I woke up in the middle of the night and sometimes you can get a message from a movie. Right. And a movie with Tom Cruise as Carl Magnolia. And I never saw the whole movie, but there was a quote that woke me up around 3.15, I never forget. And the quote was, we might be through with our past, but our past is not through with us. And so I have unresolved stuff in me because for a period of time, I saw myself as being, have been given away, but there's been a shift in my consciousness. Now I look at my life and I realize I was chosen with love, that God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. And that's why I know now that I've come to grips with, now that someone, I had to get some help, and I believe ask for help, not because you're weak, but because you want to remain strong and ask for help and don't stop until you get it. And I said, you said this is not unto death for me, search my heart. And I said, can you help me go there? And she did, because sometimes somebody can take you to a place within yourself that you can't go by yourself. And in that session, I realized the anger and and the hatred that I had for two people that I, I, I don't even have faces for. I've never seen my birth mother, a birth father. And, and so I had to resolve that. I had to forgive myself first and then forgive them. And that's when the healing takes place because cancer a cells gone crazy. Yeah. And so now as I move to a place of love, God is love and he who dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in them. As I move to a place of love for them that, that now I'm in harmony and in integrity who, with who I am as a person and I have forgiven myself, I've forgiven them, and I'm living this mission of making the world a better place than how I found it, of being a source of light and hope and inspiration for people. And you're doing an awesome job. There is no long-term benefit for being a grudge holder, um, holding resentment toward people. I always tell people, people say, well, do things bug you? Well, things bug me, but listen, yeah. I don't. I don't live there. And I always tell people, I let things roll off my back. You can criticize me all day long. And you know what? I'm not going to internalize that. Yes. Right? Because I know who I am and I'm thankful for who I am. Anyway. Yes. And, and that is real because the stuff we take on is, is they said, 
hating someone is like drinking poison and, and, and say, okay, now you're going to die. <laughs> no, it's not going to happen like that. Yes, no, we, we all need coaching on how to let some things go. One of the things that I teach is let go or be dragged. That there are certain things that you know that you need to let go of. Otherwise, it's going to compromise your power and it's going to drag you down. And yeah, it takes time to do that. It does. It does. So in your book, I remember this story. Yeah. Such a great book. Anyway, you. Um, you walked in, I think it was to a junior high or an elementary school, and you said, there's greatness in this room. If you're here, would you please stand? Yeah. And you had to say it over <laughs> and over. And then yes. one, one young person, didn't they stand up and they said, up here I right. am. Yeah. Here I am. And that young man, I'm working with him today. Oh, you're kidding. No, he's been with me since that time. He, he is an attorney and he also worked with you. We go to prisons and juvenile detention centers together. Yes, and he's truly manifesting his greatness. And I'm proud to say I'm one of his mentees because it's a seesaw relationship. At first I started out being his mentor, but he has an incre incredible skills with the millennials and with technology that I don't have. Oh. And so he's teaching me how to connect with them and how to use technology to further the work that I have, that I'm doing, and to create non-performance income. So this thing called life, I believe that you, you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. And he's teaching me and I, I'm proud of it. That's awesome. Take full responsibility for your life. Accept where you are and the responsibility that you're going to take yourself where you want to go. Someone said we have two primary choices in life. We can either accept conditions as they exist or we can take the responsibility to change them. See, a lot of people want to exempt themselves from taking responsibility. All they want to do is talk about the problem. Every time you see them, they'll tell you their story over and over and over and over again. No, no. You want to take responsibility for your life. I got me here. I can get me out of this. And I'm getting out. I'm not going to be a volunteer victim. George Bernard Shaw said there are two kinds of people in life. You know, he said, those that make things happen, those that watch things happen, and those that don't know what happened. <laughs> and he said, the people that get along in this life look around for the circumstances that they want, and if they can't find them, they make them. They create them. So part of beginning to get unstuck, you've got to decide that the behavior pattern that you have adopted doesn't work for you. You've got to change your strategies, and changing your strategy means reinventing your life recreating you and you have the power to do that you can decide that you're going to change that you're not going to be a wimp you can decide that you're going to stand up to life you can decide that i'm going to live each day as if it were my last you can you have the power to make that decision you can decide i'm going to work on myself and develop myself i'm going to empower me and all of these things that are happening to me right now, they're just temporary inconveniences. They're not stronger than I am. I'm in charge here. Next thing is separate what you do from who you are. That's what the guilt trap is about. See, a lot of folk won't let you forget what you used to do or what you have done, what mistakes you've made. All of us have made some mistakes in life. All of us have done some things that if we had them to do over again, we wouldn't do it again. There are a lot of things that if I had it to do over again, if I knew then what I know now, I would have done it differently. Well, it didn't happen that way. And that's what you call life. I didn't do it like that. Oh, you don't want me to live that down. How you want to keep on putting that in my face about what I did. Guess what? I'm not interested. That's what I did then. Won't do it today, so you are picking on an innocent man. Hello. Yeah. 
So as you're in the process of reinventing your life, write a description of the kind of person that you want to be. What are the things that you must overcome? What qualities about your personality you know that you're going to have to change because those particular characteristics are liabilities to you? What are your assets? What are your strong points? Look at and evaluating yourself to make that determination. Other thing is that in order to get out of a rut, we need some coaching. Find some trusted critics. People that you know care about you and love you. So there's some things that keeps us from growing and getting out of ruts. Number one, we identify with feedback. We take it personal when someone wants to give us some feedback on where we are falling short and tell us about our blind spots. We want to have everything being positive about us. We're not perfect. It's, it hurts. I, I have a friend who's a trusted critic. I don't like him, but I love him. He doesn't tell me the things I want to hear. He tell me what I need to hear so I can grow. It hurts. It hurts when he put me on the hot seat. I can't stand it. But that's the only way that I can grow. And I'm glad that he loves me enough to risk our friendship to tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. Get a support group, somebody that you can talk to, people who perhaps might have a similar problem. Support groups are very powerful, that you can share some of the challenges that you're going through. And it might be a situation where one person can give you an idea of how they handle that situation and create an opening for you. Begin to stimulate some possibilities in your mind on how you can resolve the problem. We can't grow by ourselves. As I mentioned before, we grow from people and projects. The other thing is about life, when things happen to you, when you permit things to use you, you can't change the past, but you can interpret. You can reinterpret how you see it. For years, I was going around with a heavy load on my shoulders feeling bad because I was adopted, doing interviews for adoption agencies and foster homes. And I was on television once and I, I told these people in this particular interview that I was given away, my twin brother and I, when we were six weeks of age. A friend of mine fortunately was listening to the program. And she said, Les, I'd like to have lunch with you. And so I went over to see her. She said, when a woman carries a baby for nine months, feeling that life movement in her, it's automatic and natural for her to learn to love that baby, to expect it to come here when she bears the pain to bring it into the world. Your mother, Mamie Brown, when she came in to adopt you guys, she didn't go through that process. She looked at whoever your biological mother was and said, I'll take her. You weren't giving away less. You were chosen with love. 